Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the September Tala Hour session. Um, as you can see, I am not Diana Martinez. My name is Helen Hunsinger. I am the Director of Communications, standing in for our President Diana Martinez today. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the session. We're really excited that you're here. Um, we've got John with us, and we're really excited because this is actually the first time that we've ever done a live culinary demo on a Tala Hour. So, um, we hope you get a lot out of this session today, and thank you for being with us. Um, just a couple ground rules for the Tala Hour event today. Um, we are recording. Um, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. I will be keeping an eye on the chat um, during the session, and then if we get to a good place for some Q&A, um, we'll visit some of those questions. Uh, we're really excited to have John Jednak with us today. He is a culinary professional with over 20 years experience um, in the restaurant field and um, has been everywhere from Napa, California to Greenville, North Carolina and to owning his own restaurant in New Mexico. Um, but since 2013, he's been with Healthcare Services Group and um, we're really excited to have John with us today talking about memory care dining um, and healthcare services group is a wonderful industry partner with Tala. So we definitely thank healthcare services group for their support. Um, so yeah, so when John's not at work, he can still be found in the kitchen entertaining family and friends. Um, so John, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you, Helen. Hello, everybody. My name is John Jednak. Like Helen said, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about memory care dining, but also some simple basic culinary techniques today. Um, first and foremost, when we're in a kitchen at any point in time, it's important that we're, number one, safe. Safety is the first protocol. So we want to make sure that we have our knives and we understand how to hold them the right way with our two thumbs and keep, keep our back heel uh, on the board um, at all times. We don't want to make sure that we're not moving the knife all over and, and understand that they are sharp and keep our, our extra extremities out of the way. The other piece that's key when using a cutting board is either using a cutting board that has rubber stoppers around the corners like this one does right here, or we have some type of matting underneath that keeps the cutting board from moving. The last thing we want to do is have the cutting board moving around while we're trying to cut an object. Um, we're going to start out with a few culinary techniques, cutting techniques um, that we're going to be using today in our demo. And I'm going to demo those first, and then we'll jump into plate presentation, garnishing, and different aspects um, when it comes to memory care. Um, for those who have the ability to use their, their hands and, and appendages the right way and those who don't. So I'm going to grab a, a couple of of things to put here on my cutting board and, and we'll get started. So this is our chicken breast that we have here, uh, just salt, pepper, garlic, seared, and then put into a 365 degree oven, cooked on a roasting rack. Um, we don't cook by time, we cook by temperature. So we need to make sure that the internal temperature here is at 165 degrees. Once it is, we pull it out, we let it rest. Um, when we're talking about memory care dining, uh, there's several ways we can do this. Uh, just to serve a whole chicken breast like this, whether it's memory care dining, regular dining, it doesn't matter. Uh, we want to make sure that we cut it the right way to present it on the plate. Um, the way that we want to do that is you can see that there's the tip of the chicken here. We want to turn that. I'm right-handed, so I want to turn that away from my body where my knife hand is. I want to take my knife. I'm going to hold my two fingers at the base and I'm going to cut and you can see I'm not cutting straight down on it. I'm actually getting so you can see kind of a, a sharp angle on the piece of chicken like this. See this? This is known as a julienne cut. So we would come and we would julienne our chicken like so. Remember keeping that angle. It's about a 45 degree angle. What this does is it, it cuts across the grain of the chicken and it's, it's going to allow us for the chicken to be soft and tender um, 
it's also going to look better when we talk about plate presentation. So once we cut that, there we go. We keep it whole. And I'm just going to slide this at the top of my board and we'll use that later for when we do our plate presentation. The other, the other cut that we're going to talk about today um, is very common when it comes to uh, vegetables that are round. Um, you can do this in potatoes, carrots, anything that's round, cylindrical. Such uh, This is a zucchini, a uh, green zucchini, can be done in squash. This cut's really good um, for roasting or sauteing. It's also really good uh, when we talk about finger foods for memory care. Um, so the name of this cut is called Asek, and it is a rolling cut. So you're going to take your knife and you go right, you roll it over and you go left, you roll it over, you go right, you roll it over and you go left. Now this, this cut gets you nice chunky pieces. The reason that this is really good for sauteing and roasting is if we were to cut, and I'm just going to use this as an example, if we were just going to cut medallions like so, if you saute these up or roast them, um, they get real soggy, real mushy. Um, from a finger food perspective, they would not be very good to pick up with your hands. Um, so these are two cuts that are really essential when we talk about um, cutting the right way, being able to hold and preserve the vegetables um, for memory care dining and, and for finger foods. The other piece is um, if we're using any type of holding app, if we're using any type of hot holding um, apparatus such as a steam table or a Bain Marie or an auto sham or anything like that, those will that cut will hold up real well uh, when it comes to um, holding of, of the food. Um, we're gonna move into uh, different plate presentations and garnishing. Um, first, we're gonna start off with the plates. Um, you can see this plate right here. It has a blue border around it. One of the things um, that we like to talk about in, 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 in all long-term care, whether it's memory care, assisted living, long-term care, healthcare in general, for those who have suppressed appetites, um, the color blue um, is used to stimulate people's appetite. So you notice that this plate isn't completely blue, but the border is blue because we're gonna fill in the middle and we want them their eyes to come to the middle of the plate, but we also want their eyes to come to this blue border to help stimulate their appetite. So at the end of the day, they're gonna see the food, see the blue, and it's going to help stimulate their appetite. So we're gonna we're gonna do a a short uh, plate presentation. We're gonna do one regular, and we're gonna do one that is for memory care dining. Um, okay. So we'll do one that's regular. So we're going to start with our starch, which is just plain jasmine rice here. And I like to put it in a type of mold or bowl and get it to have some height on the plate, right? So one of the, one of the big things when, when it comes to plate presentation, um, you want to center, you want to center the plate, but you also want to create height. Um, so now we have our starch down. Uh, we're going to take, we have some peas here. We're going to take our peas. We're going to place them around our starch. Then we're going to press our starch down. Now we've created a base with a barrier around it. 
And then we're going to take our chicken. We're going to fan our chicken out over top of our starch. And then we're going to take our sauce that we have here. And we're just going to give a nice drizzle over the top. And then last but not least, we're going to garnish. So our garnish can be anything. We just want to make sure that, that whatever we're garnishing with, uh, we, you know, put it, make sure that we know that it's garnished. And then there we go. Now, the other good thing about this that can be done is if you're in a, in a memory care unit or an AL unit, you know, maybe this is the special of the day. I would go ahead and pre-plate these up and have mock plates sitting up at the front of the dining room, maybe like on a cart or over by where people um, come in, uh, wh wherever, wherever people are going to see it. Um, so they can be excited about the food and understand what's being served. So this, this is an example of just a regular plated food. And now we're going to move on to more of a memory care food plating. So we're going to julienne our chicken once again. Put that to the side. Now, there's one or two thoughts here, right? We can serve peas uh, to our memory care folks. Um, if they have finger foods, we want to make sure that we're using a coffee mug, right? So we want to put our peas in our coffee mug. This way they can pick it up. They can use their fingers to eat it with. So we would serve that on the side. The rice, the rice is pretty sticky. Um, it can be picked up with their fingers. They can push it together. So we would serve that the same way. And if you didn't want to do, if you didn't want to do the peas in the in the coffee cup that way, then we would come back to our zucchini that we did our offset cut. And we would come back and see the this is after it's sauteed. So see how well it stayed together. There's some body to it. We're able to actually pick that up with our hands. So we could do this two ways. If you wanted to switch the veg up to accommodate the finger food folks, that's perfectly okay in my book. As long as you're serving the right portion size, then you would fan your chicken back out. And these are perfect for finger foods. They're already in strips. They should be moist and tender. We're going to add our sauce, and then we're gonna add our garnish. And here we go. So two, two trains of thought here, regular plating, finger food plating, you know, we, we switched the veg up from the peas to here if we wanted to keep the veg the same, the recommendation would be serving it in a coffee cup so it can be picked up and your fingers can be used to eat it. So from there, let's talk about different plates. So these two plates that are down on the table right here, these are standard uh, nine inch plates. They're melamine, they're really lightweight, they're plastic. They're durable. Um, they're not too terrible. 
You can also find larger plates. I feel like larger plates, this is melamine, this is a 12 inch plate. Um, in my rule of thumb, smaller is better. You keep things tighter on the plate. Um, the plate looks like it's fuller with less food. Um, you don't wanna overwhelm somebody. The other thing that can be used if you're not gonna do plated um, is using platters such as this. So this platter, it's a small platter. We don't want huge platters um, because if we have huge platters, um, the food, by the time it gets to where it needs to be, um, serving off platters, it gets cold. So small platters should serve three to four people. Um, you can have a cart that goes around, um, you know, for the meal service and have, you know, for four people, you know, there's four portions on this platter whether it's the peas, the chicken, uh, even the rice can be on here, and you would just simply serve it to those people at table side. The other thing that's really good uh, to try to do is pre-meals service. Um, we've, we've seen this in a lot of our ALs and even some of our ILs. Um, we get the little small coolers. Uh, we take the washcloths and we roll them real tight. Uh, and then we get some hot water, not boiling hot water, but just hot enough. Um, we drop a couple of drops of essential oils into that water, and then we put it over the top of those towels and we close the cooler. And then while people are coming into the dining room and they're being seated, they can have a warm towel to wipe their hands, their face, and then the essential oils also help stimulate their appetites. So that's another nice touch that we can use, um, just depending on the acuity level uh, of of the of the person in the program. Um, beverage carts are beverage carts are really nice. Um, you know, we would set it up as a normal beverage cart, be able to push it around and have two or three different options. This way, we're serving at the table. And simultaneously, while we're pushing the beverage cart around, we're also putting maybe baskets of bread on the table. Uh, the other thing is when it comes to memory care um, and especially people with finger foods, it's very important that everything that comes to the table, condiments, butter, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, whatever it is, should come in ramekins. Um, I like to use non-disposable ramekins because you're going to throw away a thousand ramekins a day if you have disposables. If you use the reusable ones, they look nice. They display well. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, but anything that you're going to be serving in this type of environment, especially memory care, they should, they should have their condiments in ramekins and not in PCs such as like ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise packs, so to say, or even butter. Uh, everything should be put in here because people have a hard time opening those. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing that. Um, but putting putting butter uh, in the ramekins with the bread basket on the table while you're taking someone's drink order so they can have, you know, almost like bread on the table, like when you go to a restaurant. You know, they bring you, they take your drink order, they bring you some bread, then the next food course comes out. Um, it's really important, you know, taking it and elevating it. The next thing would be, do you offer a salad? If you're going to offer a salad, are you going to offer a salad using family style, where you have like a portion salad on a, on a tray like this? Or you're going to do smaller plates. So this was a six-inch plate. Well, what, what we would do instead is we would use a four-inch round. So they'd be small dinner plates. They also call them B&B, &B, bread and butter plates. So just setting up your program and understanding, you know, who your audience is and what you're trying to accomplish is very important. Um, we went through the plated entrees, pieces, whether you're going to do plated or family. And then when it comes to desserts, uh, the last thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that if you're going to do plated desserts, that you're pushing them around the with a cart, or you're going to also 
maybe do pre-plated desserts on a cart and then have some kind of ice cream. Um, last but not least, we get to the snack program. The snack program is, uh, is huge. Um, it's what we use throughout the day to, uh, it's what we use throughout the day um, to subsidize what we're doing um, between meal services. And at the end of the day, um, there's lots of different things that we can do in our snack program to make sure. Um, a lot of people in memory care are up walking around, they're up um, on their feet each and every day. Um, so we wanna make sure that we have something that is handable, whether that's sandwiches, my personal favorite for the snacks um, is wraps um, and not whole wraps and not a lot, but you can do turkey, cheese, lettuce, tomato in a wrap. Uh, use, use a 12 inch tortilla, cut it in half, wrap that up with some parchment paper, um, put that in the refrigerator. You get, you know, people need to need to eat on the go. They're able to grab a wrap. We can also talk about, cheese and crackers. Um, that's a really good one. Um, peanut butter and crackers is a really good one as well. And then also some people like, you know, veggies like crudite. So like celery sticks, carrots, um, broccoli, um, with some type of dipping sauce, whether that be a hummus or some ranch dressing, um, whatever that looks like. Um, those are really good, clean snacks. Um, when we talk about our memory, memory care program. Um, so the last piece I want to talk about when we talk about memory care um, is just the customer service aspect and understanding what it means. Um, people in this environment, you know, they, they tend to um, get frustrated because they can't remember or they want something now and then short time period later they see their neighbor eating something else and they no longer want what's in front of them they want what their neighbor has so it's really important to understand that um, it's not like a normal setting right we want to make sure that we're accommodating and, and understanding and helping uh, these folks at the end of the day um, be able to ingest the nutrition that they need um, and do it safely and soundly. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and open it back up to Helen um, for anybody with any questions, comments, or can. Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, this is really interesting. So one of the things that I'm thinking of, and, and this is an area where I don't know very much, um, but one thing I'm thinking of too is by having items in a mug, um, in addition to, you know, wraps or some of those easier to eat, more portable foods that you were talking about is if someone's distracted during mealtime, they could take, they could carry a mug with them. Um, you know, in a, in, as an alternative to sitting down with, with a plate in front of them. So, um, yeah. Okay. So let me jump into the Q and a here. I see we got a couple, um, questions. So the first question we have here is how do you recommend ways to get more fluids into memory care residents? Um, from a fluid standpoint, um, a lot of good things are flavored waters. Um, we, we usually do like lemons and different things like that so that they're not taking in juices or sodas or things like that. So flavored waters is a really good way because it's actually hydrating them. A lot of that other stuff that you put in um, and then even like the coffees and things like that that are high in caffeine, those are natural diuretics. So that actually like dehydrates you, even though you are drinking liquid, it's not really keeping you hydrated. Um, so flavored waters is a really good way. I mean, you can go into your kitchen right now and find probably whole oranges, whole lemons, whole limes. All you have to do is just cut up a couple of those, basically making like agua fresca. You can get 
creative. You can put fresh mint in there. You can put strawberries in there. You can put blueberries. You can get creative and mix and match a bunch of different things. But having that, that flavored water um, is a really good way to keep people hydrated um, without giving them what they don't need. Okay, great. Yeah, and they're getting something a little bit tastier. So maybe it's a little bit more exciting than regular plain old water too. And the and the and then and then, and then the other side of it too is if you're making soups, um, try not to make cream soups. Cream soups will fill you up and you know there's not a lot of liquid. If if you make more brothy soups, that's a good way to get liquids inside people. Um more so from like a food perspective as opposed to just drinking. Yeah. Okay, so next question here is, what do you typically put on the snack cart? Uh, on the snack cart, um, like I said, we usually do um, crackers. Um, we, we, we slice our own cheese and we we have our own crackers and we kind of make our own cheese and cracker combo we also do the peanut butter cups ourselves um that we do in the small ramekins with crackers um we also put some type of fruit whether it's grapes strawberries uh things that are handable that you know aren't going to to be hard or orange slices apple slices work out really well um and then we also do half sandwiches, whether it's egg salad, tuna salad, um, chicken salad, pimento cheese. Um, we do peanut butter and jelly, but we try to we try to give people half sandwiches because we know that, you know, they don't eat normally large meals. They like kind of break up their meals uh, each and every time. So. Uh, we like to put stuff on there that'll help carry them to the next meal, whether that meal is a snack or that meal is an actual sit down, lunch, breakfast, dinner, so to speak. Great. Okay, so there's a couple questions here about um, modified textures and pureed food. Okay. So I'll ask you both questions here at the same time. So the first question is, as a chef, what are your suggestions for presenting and managing puree or modified texture food? And then the second question about pureed food, which is, is kind of along the same lines, um, is how do you make pureed food more appealing? So there's a couple of different trains of thoughts. We'll, we'll start with puree and then we'll talk about other modified textures. Um, when it comes to pureed food, uh, the key is, um, Less is more when it comes to like thickening the food. Obviously, we want to thicken it so that there's no aspiration. Um, but we want to make sure that we drain the liquid really well. That'll help us. That'll help us not have to put so much thickener in it. The more moisture in it, the more thickener you have to put in it to keep it bound together. So the drier we can get our food when we put it into our food processor to puree it, um, the better off we are. So we won't get clumps either. Um, it won't be so glossy. Um, it'll be true, true puree. Um, depending on the, the amount of puree foods in your facility, um, if you have a large amount, um, it's really good to, um, it's really good to use the right size portions and everything. But if you have a small amount, and maybe you can do this with a larger amount, but I haven't had great success, but Using piping bags um, is a really good way to pipe your purees. Um, and it's it's really good for you to understand how to pipe and then use the sauces and the gravies as a, sorry, I think I lost you. Use the sauces and the gravy um, as a garnish, right? We don't want to put any garnish on a puree plate that's going to choke or aspirate. Um, so we want to make sure that we're using the sauces and the gravies as a garnish. Um, and the other modified textures, the key is with that is you want to keep it as moist as possible, right? If you're having mechanically ground altered food, um, whether you're using 
dysphagia or itsy, um, you want to be moist. Nobody wants to eat a ground up piece of chicken that's dry, like salt, like salt dust, right? So you want to make sure that you're encompassing the sauces into it, keeping it moist so it's palatable, so you can swallow it. Um, and, and that's the key piece with most mechanically altered foods. The other thing is like pasta is really hard to, to mechanically alter like puree. So there is a product out there called pastini. It's almost like cream of wheat. Uh, cream of rice is really good to use instead of trying to puree rice. Um, there are certain things that just won't puree. I mean, we're Texans, right? And we like to eat brisket. Brisket is extremely hard to puree just because of the bark that's on the outside of the, of the meat. Um, so just understanding like what we can and can't do with these modified textures. Maybe it's, I know this sounds expensive, but taking off the bark before we puree our brisket or making brisket where we wrap it and we don't create that bark on there, right? Um, just understanding what we can and can't do from these modified textures is really important. Okay, great. Okay, so next question here is about um, the blue. And um, so you spoke about the blue color enhancing appetite, which I actually have a funny personal anecdote about this. When I was growing up, our plates had a blue circle on the border. Um, and my parents always used to say, watch your blue line. So the food would stay within the blue circle on the plate. So I think that was just their way of keeping my brother and I meat eaters. But it's funny that it also, I mean, you know, knock on wood, none of us have Alzheimer's, but um guess my parents were ahead of the curve on that one. So, <laughs> um, okay. But the next question here is, um, since blue enhances an appetite, would you recommend blue, uh, plate maps or a tiled top table with blue and white tile and border blue napkins, um, or anything else on the table that's also blue? Yeah. I mean, you just, you want, you want to make sure that there are, is focused on the blue that's on the plate, right? So when we're talking about eating, people eat with their eyes first, and then they decide, am I going to ingest that or am I not, right? So if you have a ton of blue stuff around you, yes, it might suppress, I mean, it might uplift their appetite, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they might lose focus on that plate that's sitting right there in front of them. So you can have other blue things. Um, I mean, my recommendation is keep it tight so that they're focused on the plate, which focuses on the food, which indulges them to eat what's on that plate, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so next question here says, what are your thoughts on managing residents' preferences for sweets and salty foods, but keeping nutrition in mind? That's a really good question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, if we're talking about the overall scope of residents, not just in memory care, um, it's our it's our responsibility to educate our residents and let them know what is right and what is wrong. But at the end of the day, we can't make those decisions for them. So unless we're going to be giving them something that's going to put them in detrimental shape, like uh, you need to be on a puree diet, well, no, I'm going to eat regular food, they aspirate, that's one thing. But if it's, I'm a diabetic and I know I shouldn't eat a whole piece of cake, I should maybe eat half a cake or I should eat the sugar-free dessert. Uh, that's where our clinical team comes into play with our dietitians and, and our CNAs and our nurses and whoever else is involved with our caretaking of our patients. You know, have that conversation with them. If they're cognitive, um, you know, explain what, what the risks are behind it. If they're not cognitive, then we should be having that conversation with their family members and, and letting them understand the risks um, and, and letting them make those decisions. Um, but using certain things like with low sodium, um, you know, garlic powder is a natural flavor enhancer, right? It's also good to lower cholesterol. So instead of putting salt on something while we're cooking it, let's use garlic. That will enhance the flavor without bringing up the sodium content. Um, when we're also talking about sweetening things, right? Um, as opposed to raw sugars um, and complex carbohydrates, which carry all those different sugars. 
you know, maybe we use light sweeteners such as agave honey or agave or honey or something like that to sweeten it where it's, it's less potent um, and it's natural than, than what we would use as sugar in the raw. So those are just some ideas. Um, there's lots of stuff out there that you can, you can take a look at. Um, just be, just understand um, when we're talking about um, complex carbohydrates and also synthetic sugars, we might think we might be doing ourselves a favor. And in reality, there's no real difference in eating the real thing and the synthetic blend of it. So. Great. Okay. So we've got a couple more questions here. Um, I actually have a question as well. So two things that you touched on earlier in the presentation today were both, um, you started off right at the beginning with safety, and then you mentioned a little bit further on a little bit about um, the service experience and the whole ex experience as a whole. So in terms of safety and from a staff perspective, um, uh, number one, what are some safety concerns or safety things to look out for that staff should be aware of that differentiates memory care dining from um, quote unquote regular dining. And then uh, part two, if there's, you know, a lot of distractions or if there's, you know, a lot of difficulty with residents eating their food, uh, what are some recommendations you have for staff to kind of either cope themselves to not get stressed or to um, encourage residents to, to eat their food? Um, so encouragement is key. And the understanding is, is that this is a very patient occupation, right? And at the end of the day, we need to have lots of patients sitting down, making someone feel comfortable, whether they're um, the blue plate helps, whether we're, you know, talking to them in a, in a soft tone and not getting frustrated, right? If, if you need to help assist them eat, um, at the end of the day, you know, you want to just be able to sit down and comfort them. Um, that's why I think like the towels with the essential oil is really good. Um, creating a good dining atmosphere where maybe it's like light music in the background, you know, not having super bright lights, but not, not also super dim lights. Um, there's lots of things that we can do to kind of relax and get people um, in the mood to eat. And then understanding a win may only be half a plate, right? It, it, like not everybody's going to be in the clean my plate club every night or day or whatever it is. That's why we also have the snack programs that we subsidize those meals with, because if they're not going to get it at that seating, they're going to have the opportunity to get it, you know, maybe at the, the between hour snack, like the two o'clock snack break. Um, so hopefully that answers your question on that. And then the first question, can you refresh me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure thing. Um, just in terms of safety in the memory care dining experience, is there anything in particular that staff should look out for that, you know, kind of safety concerns that are present in memory care dining that might not be um, present elsewhere? Yes. So when it comes to safety, especially with finger foods, a lot of these foods are cut into the portion sizes that are perfect for choking. So you want to make sure that because we have to cut them in that portion size to, the, to accommodate them to use their fingers to pick them up, it, it also is a negative because it's perfect for them to put it in their mouth and try to swallow it and choke on it. So just keeping an eye on that is very important. Um, the other piece is, is um, you know, if someone's sitting at a table with other people that have modified textures um, and this person has a regular texture, that person has a puree, so forth and so on, or they're on thickened liquids or anything like that, making sure that we're keeping appropriate distances so th that people can't reach on other people's trays or other people's plates or be able to grab other people's liquids and ingest them. So just, I don't want to say keep like-minded consistencies together because that's not right, right? If Miss Jones likes to eat with Miss Miss Jones or whoever it is, um, we don't want to stop that from happening, but just kind of understanding what that space looks like, especially in an environment where there's less cognitive and they don't really know that that can hurt them. So, yeah, great. 
Great. Okay. So the next question here, um, this might be a little bit of a tricky one, and, and maybe this has a little bit of a clinical aspect to it as well, but... Um, I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what do you recommend for anyone who is just getting started with creating a weekly menu for memory care dieting and for someone just getting started? Um, I mean, you want to pick a diet manual. You want to understand your diet manual. That's first and foremost. Um, once you pick a diet manual, there's tons of recommendations in that diet manual that can help you on your way. Uh, and then you want to sit down and when you write a menu, once you have your diet manual, then you create menu rules. This is this is the rules that we're going to follow. Doesn't matter what food items are on there. What we're going to say is there's going to be breakfast meat every day or there's going to be eggs every day. There's going to be oatmeal every whatever you determine it is. You should write your 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 rules for breakfast, lunch and dinner. You follow those every single time you write a menu and then you just plug and play in food items um, as you go down. So if we're going to serve only sandwiches and salads at lunch, well, then that's what it is. And at dinner, it's going to be more substantial, like an entree, a starch, and a vegetable. Um, just putting those together and understanding it's going to really help you identify, you know, what you need to fill out and what slots. And then you can come back after your, after that, and then you can extend your menus throughout, through, yeah. through the diet. Yeah. I mean, it definitely sounds like this is this is not an area where I have a lot of background knowledge, but it sounds like one of the tricks with memory care dining, creating a menu, um, there might be a need for a little bit of repetition because if someone didn't get certain nutrients at dinner, you know, maybe you try again the next day with a variation on a theme or something, you know, while you're still trying to balance, you know, the salt, the sweet, the hydration, some of the questions that um, folks have already asked here today and while doing all that, but maybe it's a little bit easier if you can have, you know, I mean, certainly it's tricky in its own way, um, but maybe it's a little bit easier if you have, you know, if you're trying to get a lot of fresh vegetables in, for example, if you have one vegetable one day, so if someone was, you know, wandering around and not really focused, they get, you know, a lot of fresh vegetables again the next day or something to that effect, but. Um, right. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, the other key piece is, is just really understanding your population and what and where they came from. Right. Mm -hmm. Because let's just be honest, like if I came from a traditional Southern family and I was in a space where, where I was going through dementia or memory care loss, I'm probably not going to eat Chinese food a lot. I'm probably not going to, you know, I'm not going to eat, you know, Spanish food a lot. I mean, we can sprinkle those in but we want to kind of understand our population and what, what really is nostalgic to them because food is nostalgic, right? You take a bite of something that brings you back to a place in time. Yeah. So if we can continue, if we can continue to put those type of things on a plate and even get them to take that first bite, it might trigger something in their mind. And they're like, Oh my God, I, you know, keep me coming back for more type of deal. So just really understanding who we are as a population and what really brings people to eat, to want to eat, to be hungry is another key piece too. That's a really great point. Yeah, I mean, today we've you've kind of talked about this whole 360 experience of dining where it's about the food, of course, you're there to eat, but it's also about the ambiance, you know, whether there's some, some light music or, you know, gentle lighting so it's not super harsh and, um, you know, scents with the essential oils and even the color of the plates. It, it sounds like it's really about, um, you're not just going there to eat, you're going to have an experience. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting that the specific food would have a memory trigger that would encourage people to eat. That's, um, yeah, I mean, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, we've got a couple more questions here. So um, thank you everyone for putting in your questions. We are slated to go until the top of the hour. So we have time for a couple more questions for sure. So if you haven't asked a question yet, please go ahead and put it into the Q&A and um, hopefully we'll have time to get to it. So, okay. So the next question here is, do you incorporate cooking? Uh, hang on, sorry. Let me rephrase this a little bit. 
Okay, so when it comes to memory care dining, um, we already talked a little bit about, you know, between the sugar, the salts, the hydration, there's kind of a focus on, you know, having this balance and making sure that people are getting nutrition on a routine basis. So do you, when it comes to memory care dining, do you recommend any substitutions for a memory care menu, um, substitutions for better health? For example, um, I, I know for me personally, I feel like I read all the time, like, oh, the Mediterranean diet is so good. The Mediterranean diet is, you know, and that's like a popular thing. Another thing um, that this person referenced in their question is, um, do you incorporate um, cooking oil as a substitute since it's said to help with brain health? Um, so are there any uh, recommended substitutes that you have to use in uh, memory care dining? Yeah, I mean, once again, you know, um, we, we want to make sure people are getting the nutrition that they need and, and food is nostalgic. So we want to put things that are in front of people. So I would say that there are some substitutions. It just really depends on the people that are sitting down to eat it. Um, I mean, some of the healthy al al alternatives are, um, you know, introduce as many different colored vegetables as possible. Try to use as min much fresh produce as possible. Try to try to lean towards more lean proteins, such as chicken, um, pork, as long as it's clean the right way, fishes, um, red meat every once in a while, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, I mean, if you're making spaghetti sauce, instead of using ground beef, use ground turkey, um, you know, different things like that. I mean, that's kind of how we eat at my household. Uh, we eat a little bit healthier, uh, understanding that, um, Fresh is better. Um, you know, you can eat, you can still eat macaroni and cheese, but you just don't eat macaroni and cheese every day, right? Um, everything in moderation, even moderation. That's what I said. So um, th there's there's things that that you that you can try and you can do research. And yes, the Mediterranean diet is great. Um, you know, there's there's tons of different things out there, and it, it really just depends on your on your resident patient population. It really depends on, you know, you could switch to the whole Mediterranean diet, but if nobody eats it, what's the point, right? So um, yes, it's important to be healthy. Um, I use grapeseed oil when I cook. I don't use olive oil or canola or anything else like that. So I, I use grapeseed oil. It has a higher smoke point. Um, it also is heart healthier than most of your canolas and everything else like that. Um, I use kosher salt. I don't use iodized salt. It's also, you, you use less of it because it of the grain. Um, yeah, I mean, I try not to deep fry everything. Um, you know, I, I try not to use a lot of creams. Um, instead, of I, I replace uh, Greek yogurt for a lot of the mayonnaise stuff. So when I make like potato salad, coleslaw, macaroni salad, any of those kind of dressings and that usually usually adds for mayonnaise, I subsidize it with Greek yogurt. Um, you know, little things like that that you can sprinkle in that people aren't even going to really notice the difference as long as you season it the right way. That stuff can go a long way as well. Uh, um, and then grains. Um, it's important to eat the whole grain, right? That's why when we talk about like the quinoas, the farros, uh, the bulgurs and all the all these different types of grains. Um, if you can incorporate that in your diet, that also helps with digestion. It also helps with um, removing bad cholesterol, so forth and so on. So um, sneaking, I shouldn't say sneaking, but putting those into your diet where it's, it's not normally what you eat, but if you incorporate it in some way, shape or form, like at my house, we do... Uh, stuffed peppers, right? And instead of using rice in the stuffed peppers, we use quinoa. So it's quinoa, ground turkey, black beans. We do like a Southwest stuffed pepper. Um, so just like like understanding like what you want to do, like everybody in Texas knows what enchiladas are. Well, instead of using corn or flour tortillas, maybe shaving um, zucchini long ways and making little ribbons and using that as the wrap and putting your chicken or whatever it is in there instead. So there's lots of different things that you can do to like modify the recipe 
to make it more healthier. And it shouldn't really taste different, but people are funny about their food at the end of the day too. Like there are some people that this is what I want and I'm going to eat it the way I want it. I'm like, cool. Sure. That's cool. Yeah. So. And when it comes to texture, certainly if someone notices a texture difference, maybe that, maybe that would be yeah. a little challenging, but yeah, there's, I, I, and I mean, and I feel like even just in the last couple of years, and again, this isn't really my area of expertise, but I can only imagine that, you know, a lot of the rise in popularity of healthy substitutes or really, you know, good alternatives for people who have restrictions in their diet for health reasons or for whatever reason, um, it seems like it's gotten so much more, so much, so much better. And there's a lot, just a lot more out there. So hopefully that's, something that's um, had benefits for uh, assisted living residents and memory care, memory care dining as well, where you're trying to keep everyone healthy. And, you know, yeah, if you have mac and cheese every day or, you know, maybe twice a week because it's super nostalgic for you, you know, yeah, maybe you use, you know, something healthy, a healthy alternative in there. And it's not boxed mac and cheese, but something else that's, you know, right. going to provide think- a little more nutrition. Yeah, they have chickpea pasta now. They have, you know, different things. It's just not like standard, you know. So maybe switch it up, try it out, see if you like it. Yeah, totally. I've heard a lot about Faro and Bulger, but I have yet to really check those out. But I've definitely heard a lot about those as well, too. So, yeah. okay, awesome. Okay, so the next question that we've got here is... Um, from someone who is just getting started with their assisted living business. Um, and their question is when it comes to creating, uh, uh, do, 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 they're designing, I'm gonna paraphrase this question a little bit cause it's, cause it's a long one. Um, so this person is just getting started with a small assisted living home and they're doing the design right now and they're uh, working on the kitchen. So. Uh, what recommendations do you have? Uh, what equipment, whether it's shelf, uh, you know, stove, oven, warming device, et cetera, what recommendations do you have for um, equipment and getting started? So you want to define your program first. That's the first thing you want to do. What is the expectation of the program? Am I having people come down and sit in a dining room? Am I taking it to their room as room service? Um, am I going to have servers or my, you know, whoever's on the floor is caretakers? Are they going to be serving? You kind of want to understand your program and the scope of your program. Then you want to write a menu. You want to kind of put together like I want to serve. I definitely want to serve these 15 to 20 items. Once you kind of understand what that looks like, that's when you start laying out your kitchen because you want to make sure that you can execute those 15 to 20 items. Right. And it's like trying to build a house and somebody gives you a hammer and a screw and you can't really build a house that way. Right. You need a screw gun or a screwdriver. So you want to make sure that what your expectations for what you're doing can be executed based on the equipment and the specs. And there's people out there. uh, I mean, I'm not trying to plug myself, but we do work with people, you know, and go in and consult and help them with their architects and things like that. And that's what you want to find. You want to find somebody that has the knowledge and the background. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you want to find somebody to work with your architects and your contractors to make sure that the kitchen is laid out right. And yeah, those guys, they have their own specs. But if you have this grand idea of this is what the way I want my program to be run, nine times out of 10, they have like two or three kitchen setups that this is how they run, right? This is what they do. So Um, you know, it's really important to understand what you want to do and then you can start laying out your kitchen and understanding the concepts of it and how it flows. Awesome. Great. Well, that was the last question that I saw. So, um, I think we're going to wrap up here and, um, I do have a slide that I want to share. So hopefully this will work here. So let me just switch over here. Um, So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, John, thank you so much. Again, Mr. John Jednak, he is in business development at Healthcare Services Group. Um, I don't know about you all, but hopefully you got a lot out of this. I feel like I got a lot out of this. I'm putting 
Pharaoh and Bulger at the top of my Pharaoh, excuse me, Pharaoh and Bulger at the top of my my to-do list. It's fun to try out new recipes. Um, but yeah, as a reminder, this event is a Tala hour. Tala offers these free monthly education educational sessions for um anyone to join. They're open to the public. So um please tune in. Hopefully you can learn a lot about different aspects of the assisted living industry. Um, we're really excited about our upcoming event, October 20th. I did put the link in the chat to register. And then also we do have a QR code on the screen. Um, again, these events are free. They're about an hour long, usually on Fridays, uh, sometime during the lunchtime portion of the day. Um, so here's what we've got coming up. And um, yeah, thank you again. John, and um, anything else to one last nope. thought here to leave folks with today? No, I, everybody have a great weekend. Stay safe and sound out there. Um, you know, my information's out there. Uh, if you need it, reach out to Helen. Uh, I'd love to have a conversation and see what we can do to help you out. So. Great. And I did put my email in the chat as well. So um, also my contact information is on our website, tala.org. And so thank you everyone for attending and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thank you guys. Thanks. Bye.